All right, so welcome to our, our, our webinar today, which will include a brief overview of the USDA SBIR program, followed by high level strategies for crafting competitive proposals that meet unique USDA requirements and offer tips for navigating their submission process. So our presenters today are Heidi Platt, a member of the FAST Center of Illinois consultant team, and Dr. Naru Nahar, a program specialist with the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. So Heidi is the owner of Platinum Grants and Proposals, and she's been providing consulting services since 2007 to businesses and inventors seeking SBIR STTR grant funding, having helped clients develop over $75 million in grant applications. So you're in good hands, folks. Heidi's expertise includes proposal development for several federal agencies, and prior to forming Platinum. Heidi served as a PI for NASA Phase 1 and Phase 2 SBIR projects. Today we're really also pleased to welcome Dr. Nahar. Oh, oh, I lost my, hold on a second, I lost my, I lost my script. Sorry guys. <laughs> so today we're also pleased to welcome Dr. Nahar joining today to help provide insight and guidance in response to your questions during Q&A. Uh, Dr. Nahar has been with um, NIFA as a program specialist since December 2021, and she brings to this role her background and experience in biological sciences that combine physical, chemical, and biological interactions of plants, microbes, and soils to ensure economic development while maintaining a sustainable environment. Dr. Nahar is passionate about identifying and addressing hurdles in growing tech and agribusiness within the USDA SBIR and STTR programs, she combines her passion and experience to support the agricultural industry. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Heidi to share her slides. I realized I forgot to share screen when I pulled my script over, but I'm sure you guys understand. I wanted to make sure you got a really good introduction and that you understand what we brought to the table today. So Heidi, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Um, here we are. Hello, everyone. It's good to, well, see some of you. I'm glad you've decided to join us today. I'm looking forward to giving you a little bit of background on the USDA proposals. And so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so our outline for today, we're going to do a quick overview because I'm not sure where you're coming from. So I will just do a real quick overview of SBR, SDR program, um, then go into the USDA overview, and then we'll talk about steps to start your USDA phase one application and um, the guides to writing your SDA phase one application. And then we'll leave hopefully about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, I wanted to just, I have a lot of clients who come to me and say, SBR, SCTR, what does that mean? So this is just for you to get to see, everybody just hears SBR, SCTR, there you go. You can see what the Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer, which I should point out, and it's on the slide, is new to USDA this year, which is great. Um, and so we'll talk about that further on, um, in the following slide. I wanted to give you the goals for the program, and I'm not going to read them to you because you can see them and you can get copies of this later. Um, obviously, um, the overall goal is to try to help small businesses develop technology that has high risk and high uh, uh, rewards and commercialize them. All right, next slide. Okay, we have three phase program, and this the phase one. Um, obviously, this is where you have to start you have uh, to demonstrate technical feasibility. And you have to demonstrate, usually, if you're at a point where you can't get outside investors, but you have an innovation that has, that has a great commercial potential, but there's a lot of questions and technical hurdles that have to be answered in order to get closer to where you can get other interests and closer to commercialization, um, this program is great then for you because the phase one helps you answer those immediate uh, technical questions um, and it provides the, the non-dilutive funding that you would need to help answer them. And if you get a phase one award, then you move on to phase two where you are allowed to submit a phase two proposal. And this would be continuation of your R&D and hopefully closer to commercialization. Phase three is, is typically funded 
by your investors, uh, potential users, stakeholders. This is not through USDA. Uh, other agencies like DOD and NASA, they would be part of your, they would have a phase three potentially, but for USDA, you have your phase one and your phase two, and hopefully then after phase two, you'll be able to get funding to help commercialization for your phase three. Eligibility, again, this is just listing what, what you're required as a small business. You have to be a small business, organized for profit, no more than 500 employees and U.S. owned, uh, at least 50%. Great. Now that I did that really quick overview of the SBIR program, let's get into the USDA SBIR program. And again, this year they've added STTR. So this is a table that I pulled from the uh, solicitation. And it's very helpful. I really, really am glad they included this because it helps you look at the difference between the SBIR and the SDTR. I have a lot of clients that come to me and they're like, uh, which one do I submit to? I don't know which one. So this gives you a great outline um, describing what the differences are. One thing, um, the first item, applicant, who's submitting the proposal? I have some clients that if they're doing, if it's a university involvement, they're like, well, shouldn't the university submit? No, this uh, SBIR, SDTR is still there for the small business to help commercialize the technology. So the small business is the applicant. They will submit the application and they will be responsible for managing the budget and everything involved. The award size is the same between the SBIR and SDTR. The durations are a little bit different for the SDTR. They give you a little more time. Um, I attended Melinda Kaufman's workshop. She's a USDA, um, uh, SBIR, um, I want to give the right title for her because I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, program coordinator. Was, thank you, program coordinator. Um, and she she mentioned that this duration is, can you can get extensions. Um, she said that you, you would just need to discuss that with them first before submitting your proposal. Um, so the phase one, you have eight months for SBIR. The phase one for SDTR, you have 12. Um, <clears throat> And then the difference between SBIR and SDTR, I have some clients that get concerned because they see, oh, the SBIR gets more percentage of the pot of money and USDA's budget is 34 million. So they're like, oh, should, shouldn't I go to the one that has the bigger pot? No, you need to go to the one that, that makes the most sense for your project and your, your small business and, and the team you've put together. So that, that's a good indicator there of where the funding's going, but that doesn't mean that more proposals are funded as an SBI versus an STTR, at least in my experience when I've helped both clients. So the next uh, line is a formal cooperative agreement. Is that required for SBIR? No. STTR, yes, because with an STTR, as you'll see further down on the table, you are required to have um, uh, some type of a nonprofit research institution or FFRDC involved. And so you will have to have an agreement. Um, and that answers the next line item. Yes, uh, so for an SBIR, you don't have to have university involvement or lab involvement, but um, you are allowed to, and you can have up to 33% outside services. And for an STTR, you are required to have a nonprofit research institution or uh, FFRDC. And they have to provide at a minimum 30% of the effort of the budget, basically. 30% of the budget can go to them or up to 60%. At a minimum for an STTR, 40% of the budget has to go to the small business. And so you can have research involvement in both SBIR and STTR, but which one you submit to that, if you know that you are going to have to have research involvement and outside services involvement, it's gonna be greater than 33% of the budget, then the only option then would be to submit STTR. And when I say other outside services, that would include consultants and uh, subcontracts and in addition, the research institutions, the, the creators, which I'll talk about later. So final line up item on the table is PDI, PI employment. And that's important. And the, the PDI, the PD is the project director, principal investigator is the PI. Just, we use a lot of abbreviations and acronyms in this program. So um, I apologize if I don't, uh, 
give you a definition for each, but the PDA, PDI, PDPI will be the lead on the project. They usually have the technical expertise um, and they will definitely be running the project. In an SBIR, the, the PD or PI has to be 51% employed by the small business. With an STTR, they can be either employed 51%, primarily employed 51% with the small business or the research institution. So when you have, when I have clients that ask me, which one do I do? I always ask, first of all, do you have a PI that has primary employment with a small business at 51%? Or are you utilizing someone from a university or research institution that, that has, you know, is you're going to be utilizing them instead? And looking at participation of the university, and outside services, is it gonna be more than 33%? Those are the key indicators when you're trying to decide, SBR, SETR, on what makes sense for your company. And um, a nonprofit research institution is a nonprofit college, university, a domestic nonprofit research organization. And when I say FFRDC, that's a federally funded R&D center. Sorry, I forgot to define that earlier. Um, for SBIR in the past, USDA didn't have an STTR. So for an SBIR, some of the, the scientists, um, university and government scientist involvement, they were all, they would um, they could serve as consultants, but not as PI, and they would have to reduce their employment. So now you have an option with STTR where you have a little bit more flexibility. Um, and I know another question I get is, do I need to get add um, university involvement? And we'll talk about that later in a following slide. Hopefully I didn't, I covered everything there without confusing you. Um, so the next item is project timeline. And this is the general timeline they like to follow for phase one, the RFA, the solicitation is released in July and uh, proposal to lead, deadline is October this year. The deadline is October 25th. Review and award, so once you submit, um, you'll have a review and you'll find out about, from, about the award between that time period, between December and February, and then the start project start date would be July. Phase two, um, it lists the deadlines for phase two. Remember, again, you can only submit a phase two if you've received a phase one award. Just to give you um, a little bit more background about um, the USDA program specifically, um, Melinda Kaufman uh, shared this in her webinar last week, the uh, success rate for USDA um, phase one and phase two. So in the blue, we have phase one. Um, 2020 was the first column at 16% and 2021 is 15%. That was based on, um, in 2020, there were uh, 435 applications submitted and 70 awards. And in 2021, there were 526 applications submitted and 79 awards. And she mentioned that um, it looks like the number of applications, even though they increased from 2020 to 2021, she said it looks like they're leveling off for 22. And um, and then it shows the phase two rates, which usually usually are a little bit higher than the phase one because you have a smaller pot obviously only those that are that are phase one awardees can submit a phase two so you have um, fewer awards so in, in 2020 there were 68 applications submitted and 29 awards and 2021 64 applications and 31 awards so obviously from this graph you can see that this program is very competitive but it is very it's it's very worth your while. It is definitely worth your while. And I'll talk about that later as well. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about the steps to start your USDA phase one application. So first of all, there has to be an open solicitation in order for you to submit. And lucky you, there's one open right now. And I've provided the link for you there that you could click on. It'll take you to their page. And there's another link where you can, you actually can download the RFA and take a look at it. And again, the deadline is October 25th. Next, you want to select the USDA topic area that's most relevant to your research and the product you're trying to commercialize. 
So there are 10 topic area, areas and they're, they're pretty broad and they're trying to give you an opportunity to, to try to see if there is a potential match. They've made them broad to capture more people involvement in this program. And in the RFA, the current RFA, if you open that up, you will find each of these topic areas described. They provide, um, you'll have the uh, national program leader, contact name and emails provided, your summary of goals and aims, your research priorities for that topic, and other key info. So you can go in there. That's that's really, you need to look at the ones. I mean, they'll list first these 10, and you can kind of look and go, well, I think mine should fit in plant production. I'll take a look there. But I wouldn't pigeonhole yourself in just one topic. I would go ahead and read each of the topics and take a look and see which one you think might be the best match. Next. Excuse me, sorry. Next thing you need to do, once you figure out which topic area you think you might have an interest in, you should email the relevant topic national program leader, NPL, to arrange a telephone conversation, uh, consultation. And again, you can refer to the RFA for the appropriate um, NPL email address that's associated with that topic area. And um, the email, I would include a brief summary and um, you can include um, at least at a minimum, describe your innovation and, and the research you're proposing and then ask for the telephone consultation. If you can't figure out looking at the 10 topic areas and you're like, I think I fit in four of them. I don't know which one's the best. You can send an email um, to Dave Somstad and, and ask, you know, say, hey, you know, here's what I'm doing. I don't know which one's the best fit. Who should I contact? And and then hopefully you'll get then the guidance you need then to go on to talk to the the approach to the right a topic area. That's it. Yeah. Once you send the email, I have a client that just did this this week. They send an email, gave them their summary, and the NPL re responded immediately and said, hey, let's schedule 30 minute consult. And they've already got that scheduled. It, it could be, it averages around 20 minutes, but they'll, you know, whatever, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, and it's a good time for you then when you talk to them to talk again about your phase one approach, what you're planning to do, making sure it makes sense that they agree with that and discuss your commercialization potential, ask for any guidance or any tips they may have with your proposal if, if you have the time. Um, but don't make it a marketing session. You're not trying to market. They're not the ones reviewing your proposal. Um, you know, they're, they're giving you their time. So please make, um, you know, don't abuse that time they're giving you and just utilize the time to talk about your proposal and how you're planning to proceed and if they have any suggestions. Then the next step, um, which can be tedious, it's not hard, it just takes some time. Um, you have to register your small business in um, in order to submit your application. And I would recommend you start with sam.gov right away. As soon as you know you think you're going to submit, go ahead and get started. All of the links to these uh, registrations, obviously, you can just go to sam.gov or grants.gov or sbr.gov. But <clears throat> if you, in the RFA, they have links there on, you know, they'll take you right to where you need to register. Make sure, again, you register with sam.gov first. That one takes the most time. I know I have a couple clients right now that are having delays in getting their um, unique entity ID, which is new this year. In the past, you've had to have a DUNS number. Um, <clears throat> and now they've switched over to a UEI, unique entity ID. And so I know there's been some delays in getting that. Make sure you get um, a help desk ticket if that happens. and um, And you know, and resolve that if you can contact them and get that resolved. Sometimes it's just a waiting game. You just got to wait. And um, that just happened. The changeover is in April. And so give yourself plenty of time to get this started. Don't wait, obviously. When you're decided to, to, to start working on a proposal, that's when you need to be starting on your registration. Once you register in SAM.gov, then you can go into grants.gov and register um, your organization and your, your, um, your authorized um, representative. And that is actually where you will submit your proposal is through grants.gov in their workspace. 
and it's uh, it's I have used it many times now and, and and I really I do like it and I like that it has a way to check for errors and such and so that's why it's so important to get into sam.gov grants.gov and then sbir.gov I usually wait until I have sam.gov to get that done so it can usually they'll try to take information from your sam.gov so sbir.gov doesn't take a lot of time and neither does grants.gov it's just waiting for sam.gov so make sure again key thing start on that quickly early um, next item, establish your team. So we talked a little bit about um, PD and your PI, and um, it's very important to determine who is that going to be. Is it someone, again, Are you? do you have the expertise in-house? Do you have someone that can lead the effort who has expertise in the technical and, and business effort um, and managing programs or projects? And, you know, is that person primarily employed by your small business? You want to make sure that person has the expertise and, and has the know-how to lead the effort. And is that a person from the small business or is it someone from the research institution if you decide to go SDTR? So determine that. That again, that, that needs to be happening now too. Don't wait. That needs to happen before you start writing. Um, what expertise is needed on the team? So what else do you need besides a PDPI? You don't have to have 10 people. You just need to have the people that are required to do the work plan, to, to carry out the work plan that you, you describe in your proposal application. And, you know, is that an additional engineer? Is it uh, some consultant? Um, and, and that's why I'm moving on to supporting the project. Sometimes if it's not someone within the business, you may need outside you know, I've got, I've got in-house what I need, but I need a little bit more expertise because I need a little bit of help on designing this experiment or on this technology. So you might pull in a consultant or an advisor. Um, you might have some a subcontractor um, with, or a sub-award with a research institution. And then the Cooperative Research Development Agreement, which I'm going to talk about. The, I call it CRADA. It may be CRADA. I don't know what it, I don't know how to pronounce it, but I'll call it CRADA and we could be wrong. Um, I'll talk about there on the next page. But again, it's just really important. It's, it's as important for you to have a good team as it is to have a great innovation and a wonderful work plan. If you don't have the team that can carry it out, then the reviewer is going to look at that and go, oh, you know, I just don't feel confident they're going to be able to do what they say they're going to do. So do you need to bolster your team? You know, if it makes sense for the project, for the work, and for what you're doing. Don't go out and try to find somebody from a university unless it makes sense, if it's what you need. Um, because you need to make sure you have a good working relationship with whoever you utilize outside of your business. If it's somebody that's with the university, can you work with them? Um, how are you gonna handle the IP? Who's gonna, you know, you need to coordinate that. Um, so if it makes sense to have outside services, please utilize them, but don't go out looking for it just to add it to your your uh, to your team, thinking it's going to make carry heavier weight, and th that's especially because it's got to be somebody you've got to work with, and 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 sometimes it takes time to establish those relationships, and you don't want to be doing that while you're trying to pull together a proposal. Um, so let's go on and talk about the cooperative research and development agreement. And basically, it's described here. It's it's to foster federal private collaborations. So. Um, to get technology out. And um, so you're, for USDA, they have said in their RFA that if you establish a crater with a USDA laboratory or other federal laboratory, so if your small business creates an agreement with a USDA laboratory or a federal laboratory, they say that for an SBIR, in the event that if there are two or more applications that are equal, that the one with the CRADA will have more consideration to break the tie. So that obviously is a benefit, but again, make sure it makes sense for what you're proposing to do. It mentions SBIR. The reason why SDTR isn't mentioned because when you have an SDTR, you're already going to have some sort of agreement with a research institution or an FFRDC. So um, everyone submitting an SDTR, that will all be on the equal plane there because everyone's going to have an agreement with some type of a research institution. Um, I provided a couple of links there, and um, Dr. Nahar might be able to, I'm sure she can provide more clarification on, on this uh, section of what uh, the crate is. And those were links uh, that were shared with me, and, and I 
I know there might be more questions about that. And um, there's some information there that might be helpful for you. And we can, again, discuss this further in the question and answer section. Um, finally, the final steps for, uh, to prepare your, uh, your USDA RFA is to read it. So you get the RFA. So now we get to read it. And I know it, the first time you read it, it can be overwhelming. I wouldn't just read it once because you're going to forget things. I would, as you're reading it, I usually, I usually print the first time I read one out, I print it out and I highlight areas and I highlight and mark things. And because you want to be very familiar, you want to make sure you include all the required documentation. It's very specific on what documentation you have to include. And we'll talk about that here um, in the next slide, well, in the next section of slides. And make sure you follow the guidelines because there are specific page limitations. Um, there are formatting, margins, font, uh, page numbering. Make sure you follow, you don't want to get dinged because of that. And that that is something they're trying, uh, for fairness, they're trying to make sure if, you know, if somebody submits a 20 page narrative and, and you're only required 17, that's not fair to everyone else. So you need to make sure you're, you're, you're going to, they're not going to review it if it's, if it doesn't meet those guidelines. So make sure you have all those guidelines. And there's even guidelines on um, how to, you know, name your PDF file and every attachment has to be a PDF file and there's guidelines on the, the names. Um, and and, it, and the biggest thing is make sure that your application responds to the, the valuation criteria. You know, make sure that there's a whole section there. They give you a section on evaluation criteria and what they're looking for. Make sure you include that information that they're looking for. In addition to the RFA, RFA there is the um, NIFA grants application guide, and it will refer to that. The RFA will put links in there and tell you what section. So you also need to start looking at the application guide. Now, there are they conflict a little bit. So when they're when it conflicts, obviously you're going to stick with the RFA solicitation, stick with the guidelines there. But if they say go to the application guide, you know, utilize that. Um, so those are two documents you need to get, get very familiar with. All right, here we go. Now we're gonna talk about writing your USDA phase one. So um, here's just a summary of the, of the application elements, the phase one application elements. And um, good, we're still good on time. This is, there are other, there are other uh, attachments, but I, I, they are like as required. So I didn't put them in this list. So this isn't an all-inclusive list, please refer to the RFA. This is a summary of the, the major items. And just to give you an idea, so we have the bibliography, obviously you're gonna be citing references and you should be citing references in your uh, narrative, project narrative. This is the document where you're gonna list all of those. And BioSketch is basically, it's a biographical sketch. It's like your resume. And you'll need to include that for all your senior, senior key persons um, and including consultants, if they meet the definition of key person. Um, the BioSketch, you're limited to two pages excluding uh, the publications. The budget and budget justification, again, and all these are important. You need to include all of these. The budget and budget justification obviously is very important as well. And it's important, as a side note, I should mention your budget here, the total you put in your budget should match. Um, there's a, a, in the application, the very first form, the SF424 form, will ask you what's your budget total. Make sure your budget on that form matches the budget you define on the budget form. Um, that's just a kind of a, a little tidbit, a side note to make sure those two those two numbers match. But the budget obviously is going to include your, your direct cost, your labor, and your in, other direct costs, your travel, materials, um, your outside services, which would include your consultants, your research institution, subawards, your CRADA, um, indirect costs, profit, and, um, and your technical and business assistance, which is um, the acronym is TABA or TABA. I don't know. We'll call it TABA. Anyway, um, TABA basically, uh, and USDA is allowing you to uh, include, to utilize their 
USDA vendor, LARDA Institute for technical and business assistance, which is great. I know some clients have really gotten some really good benefits from utilizing them for their phase one. And, or you have that option. So you don't, you don't have to put anything in your budget. That's already going to be part of when you receive a phase one, that's going to be part of it. Um, if you go have someone else that you want to use an assistant provider, a table assistant provider, that's not LARDA Institute then you are allowed to include in your other direct costs uh, up to $6,500 for uh, this outside TABA assistance provider. Now, that's 6,500 above and above what your, your phase one limit is. So um, that's an option as well. If you decide to use someone other than USDA's vendor, you're going to have to provide detailed budget justification and a signed letter of commitment from that vendor. And again, include that cost in your budget. Conflict of interest, that's basically just a list of uh, any co-authors or um, collaborators and such that um, each of the key personnel has. So each key personnel will submit a conflict of interest. Current pending support, that's where you're going to um, list any uh, current and uh, pending projects for, again, each of the key personnel. Um, those are forms. I should mention the conflict of interest and the current and pending support. Those are both, I utilize the forms that you can find if you're in the, um, the guide, the application guide. The um, next item, equipment and facilities, just basically, you know, you describe the equipment you'll be utilizing or you say you have access to the equipment you're going to be utilizing. Uh, facilities, again, describe the facilities you and your vendor or your uh, if you're working with a research institution, describe their facilities as well. The next item, let us support, is very, very, very important. This is something, again, that needs to, as soon as you decide you're going to submit a proposal, you should already be talking to potential stakeholders, um, you know, from potential partners, end users, consumers, investors. You should be getting letters of support from them to show and demonstrate that um, the company has had dialogue and interest. And this is, uh, Melinda uh, mentioned this last week that actually having strong letter support um, will help improve your chance of award success. So um, I don't see in the RFA that it requires a certain number or that it just says that it's strongly encouraged. When an RFA says strongly encouraged, that means you need to include at least one, if not more. Um, so I didn't see a number as far as how many. I did see there was a page. Uh, they they require they request that it's only two pages for the letters. Each of the letters should only be two pages. I did not see um, a limit on the number of letters, but it's more quantity, quality than quantity. Whoop, offset quality versus quantity. Um, so they're not looking for letters from um, from the government, you know, state or congressman. They're not looking for those. They're looking for stakeholders, potential users, uh, investors, consumers, um, collaborators. So those those letters are very important. Again, get those started when you're registering. You should already be talking. You should be already. That should be something you're already doing. Uh, trying to talk to potential stakeholders. Project narrative. I saved that for another slide, so we'll we'll go into more detail about project narrative on the next slide. And finally, the project summary abstract. Um, I typically use the form. They have a standard form you can use, and you get that in the application guide. And the form has you list the the, the PDPIs, and then you have 250 words that you can describe um, uh, your problem and your. Uh, your objectives, your effort, and anticipated results and potential commercial um, applications. And um, the RFA says, though, you don't have to use a form. You don't have to use a form. Um, you can you can include a one-page summary abstract um, with um, one-inch margins, one-page, one-inch margins, and 12-point Times New Roman font. And again, it has to include the same information. And uh, either method, I haven't seen it. It hasn't hurt using one or the other. Just making sure, though, that you do a summary and, um, again, focusing on your solution, you know, the problem, your solution, the the objectives, um, your approach, and uh, anticipated results, results and commercialization potential. All right. All right. I'm getting a text message here. Um, so we got 20 minutes still. Good. 
25 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. Got it. I forgot we're stopping at quarter cell. Okay. All right. Project narrative. All right. Here we go. The project narrative is the document that's going to take the most time for you to write. It is, it has the meat of everything you want to tell the reviewers to get them interested in um, your phase one proposal. So first of all, project narrative, you're limited to 17 pages, one and a half space. If you are doing a response, uh, so if you're doing a resubmission, you're required to include the response to previous review. That's item one, response to previous review. So if you're doing a resubmission, then you need to include that a one page, no more than one page response. And that's where you're going to address, you're going to get um, each of the proposals are reviewed um, and you'll get a copy of that review and you'll be able to see what strengths they saw, what weaknesses they saw, what they liked, didn't like, concerns they had. This is where you respond to those concerns and how you address those concerns in your new revised proposal. And, and that's really important to do that. So um, that's what section one response to previous review. So you get 18 pages if you're doing a resubmission, 17 pages for project narrative. Again, one and a half inch spacing of the, because that, that is, different than how it used to be years ago. Um, remember that phase two applicants, um, so phase one, you can do a resubmission. I should let you know, phase two, you only get to submit one time. You don't get to do a resubmission. So I wanted to point that out for phase two. Um, the responsiveness to USDA NIFA program priorities. So basically they're, they're wanting you to talk about um, whether your application has a connection to agriculturally related manufacturing and uh, alternative renewable energy. Um, if that is relevant, state that there. But also, I like my clients in the section two, I like them to talk about the importance of the project and how it aligns with the USDA topic. What topic area are you addressing and how is your solution relevant to that topic area? So that's a great place to, to do that in section two. Section three, identification, significance, the problem, opportunity. I'm going to go through these because we're running out of time. Um, that identification, you're talking about the problem, your solution, background. That's where you're going to give more detail. This is where you're probably going to cite most of your references. Um, backgrounds get be more detail about overall background, describe the current technology, what is lacking, your proposed innovation, how it will meet user and end user needs. Relationship with research and research development. Describe your anticipated phase one results and how that'll help you start phase two. And then the benefits of your research, what's it gonna, how's it gonna benefit um, the nation and users. Technical objectives, that's where you're gonna list your objectives. You've got, you've got to prove feasibility. So what are the objectives you need to do in order to prove feasibility? And that, that again, you define what feasibility is for you. And then what objectives, it could be two, three, four, five objectives. It's really rel just what works for you. Work plan. This is the section that's gonna have the most writing in it. This is where you're gonna talk about, you're gonna take those objectives and provide the detailed tasks describing how you're gonna accomplish those objectives. You know, what's the goal of the objective? What specifically are the tasks you're going to do? How are you going to accomplish those goals? And who's working on the team? Do you, do you foresee any uh, hurdles? How do you think you're going to overcome those hurdles? And um, who's going to be working on each of those you know, areas? That's a very important section. So make sure you talk about it. Uh, related research, research and development. And that's where you're going to talk about like your preliminary studies, what, what has the, the PI have already been working on or anybody in the organization? What have you been doing? What other research have you done that's relevant to what you're proposing to do now? How, how has it led to where you are now? Market opportunity, that's important section as well. You're going to talk about your market, your customers, competition, key commercial risk, and commercialization approach. Um, again, that's an important area to be able to show that there is potential out there for your product. Because if you have a great product, nobody wants it, you know. So that's that's your job to make sure you let everybody know how important, how, how much potential there is. Okay, let's get into writing tips. We're going to go through this. Okay, avoid common mistakes. This happens a lot. You fail to prove technology is innovative. I know when you know it's innovative and you, you, you feel like everyone should feel that way as well, but you have to really do a good job of explaining how it is innovative. How is it different than what's already out there? And again, if you do a good job in your narrative describing what's currently out there, and then you say, hey, boom, here's what I've got. Look, this is gonna do this, this, and this. This is why it's innovative. It's not out there right now. 
Um, another common mistake, not enough detail. Again, in the work plan, the work plan is very important. They need to know, yeah, you've got these objectives, but how are you gonna accomplish them? What are you going to do? The reviewers need to know that detail. Um, and again, not following agency guidelines, not you know, following the page limitations, the uh, not attaching the correct documents, um, not using the right format. Uh, second, demonstrate balance of high risk, high reward. I am referring back to the, the first slide I had about talking about phase one. These are the I, bulleted items I had there. You want to show your feasibility by showing there's involves a high degree of technical risk and has potential for significant commercial impact. That's the high risk, high reward. You want it to have a lot of risk, high technical risk, and but a lot of rewards. It's got great commercial impact. If you can do that well, you're going to get the reviewers very interested. That's 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 a great way um, to have some success with your proposal. Stay focused on feasibility. Again, phase one is a feasibility study. So your work plan should be focused towards a feasibility study and you define the feasibility and making sure they are objectives that can be accomplished and will give you the answer. Yes, verily, this is feasible. Um, whether it's developing whatever it is, a widget, you're developing a widget and you need to do some R&D and develop a prototype and test it. Oh yeah, it's feasible now because this, this, and this happened. Make sure you define that and you, you let them know what your success criteria is. Again, feasibility is very, that's what your goal is. Keep your writing clear and concise. You have 17 pages and I know that you might think that sounds like a lot, but it's not. There's a lot you need to say with very few little words. So again, keep your writing clear and concise. Use your company name. This is just something I like to tell my clients because sometimes, especially if you have consultants and you've got research institution or university involvement, you've got so many people involved. It, it's kind of confusing when you use we, you, you know, we are us. Who is we? Who is our? You use the small business company name and third person is usually prevalent or, or I usually like to use that. Um, like, so-and-so company did this and will do this. And um, third person, we and R get confusing. That's that's something I like to tell my clients. Um, not everybody does it and that's okay, but I think it helps with uh, understanding who's the we and us. Be pausing your approach, use will, we will do this, we will do that. Cite references again, make sure you're citing your references. Uh, plagiarism obviously is never allowed. Know your reviewers. Now I say know your reviewers, They're, you won't know your reviewers, um, they are confidential peer review. So, but understand that the reviewers should be outside experts. So they should know, they should have some inkling of your, whatever, uh, science you're introducing. So they should have an understanding of the science behind your technology. So write it, your proposal as if they, they would have some basic understanding. But again, Sometimes when I'm reviewing a proposal, though, I'll make, sometimes I'll have to say, what is this? And if it's in the industry, you know it, they will know it. Use clearly labeled, descriptive, and relevant figures. So if you're, I highly recommend use figures because you can say a lot with a figure if you say it right. But you want it to provide visual impact and communicate whatever it is you're trying to communicate. It should add value and not distract. Make sure that they can see it. It's not too small. The font's not too tiny. Just putting it in there to put it in there doesn't make sense. So use figures and visuals. Definitely use those. It helps a lot. But make sure that they can see it, read it, and understand it. Um, I should uh, the, the, use correct program code. That's on the supplemental information form, field two. That's uh, You need to make sure you use the right topic area name and the topic area code that's on that form. Um, uh, Dr. Nahar said that that must be something that happens a lot. So make sure you do that. And it, it tells you to do that in the RFA, but make sure you include the correct uh, topic area name and code under the uh, field two in that supplemental information form. And follow the rules, all the rules. Again, be familiar with your RFA and uh, guide. Finally, final tips. Be prepared. Understand that it's going to take 100 plus hours for you to work on this. It, you know, it's it's going to be an effort um, and there are going to be surprises and challenges and delays and wrong turns. But do your homework, be prepared and and get the right team put together and, and you can do this. Don't give up. Keep going. Don't give up. If you submit and you don't get a, a first time, resubmit. Don't waste your first submission. It's You've wasted your time if you don't try to resubmit. Take that uh, that advice that you you know the guidance that we were given through the review their concerns address them. Know that developing an SBI application is worth the effort. It's going to help you do so much. 
It's going to help guide you on what is my next step? Why am I not getting any funding? Why isn't anybody interested outside? You know, why, why can't I commercialize? It's going to help you know the next direction, what team you need, what actually plan do I have to have? It's really great. And finally, take advantage of your local SBR resource, Fast Center Illinois, and in complete the intake form. Woo! I think I did it. So I think we're good. <laughs> you, you did a great job, Heidi. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to share a screen with, we did receive a few questions. I have about three of them that right. came in on the chat. We'll start with those and then, um, <laughs> excuse me. And then, um, let's see, I'm going to, okay. Yep. I'm going to, oh, I have to, I'm working on it, working on it, folks. I usually do Zoom pretty well, despite that snafu earlier on. <laughs> okay. So here are the three first ones that came up. And um, if, uh, so I'll let you, let's see. It looks like number one might be a good question for, for Nurun. Yeah, sure. Hey, thank you everyone for joining. And then thank you, Heidi, for excellent presentation and great energy. I love <laughs> it. <laughs> so that's good. All right. Um, so a couple of things, I'm going to give a real experience or example. So once Heidi was talking, I'm kind of editing a lot of things that I can also share with your audiences that might be useful uh, with my experience at NIFA. So first question is conservation, the drawdown initiative. If you look at our 8.4 topic area about the conservation and natural resources, you will see that a lot of different things are covered, but those are not excluded other things. Outside of the boundary, we always will come if it is related. So if it is falling to the water quality or quantity, soil health, air resource, nutrient management, all those should be part of the conservation. So all depends on what are you are offering? What kind of technology or innovation you are thinking of? Is it source of sensor development? Is it source of a environmental related? Not knowing is really tough. So I encourage go to the 8.4 and think about your particular innovation and how that fits. Uh, it is part of our process in, in one of the topic area. So I think you get your answer for the first one. The second one is really broad. How can one apply for vaccine development? So I need to know a little bit specific, little more than the vaccine development. What are the use for vaccine development? What kind of vaccines are you are thinking? What are the users and all those things? But uh, I will refer back our topic area 8.3 because some of the proposals I see in, in uh, vaccine development related to the animal production and protection topic area 8.3. So because uh, we talk about improving the production efficiency, we talk about the food safety, quality of end products from animals, we call about improving animal health and well-being. So all those vaccine related, any innovation really can fall onto topic area 8.3. Okay. Now the third question, is it okay if the development work is in India? Yes, if you look about the SBI STTR program, we always encourage that um, our PD or PI has to be resident in the USA. And then also majority of the work should be done within the USA. There are a couple of uh, little bit of uh, differences. If you can prove that certain things you cannot do or cannot find in the supply chain to buy or manufacture, in USA, then you have to justify sometimes in Mexico or Canada, if there is a supply chain available, you need to justify that, email us to the NIFA program side, get the approval before doing it. But actually majority of the work and PD has to be done in here. Case by case, there might be little difference if you could justify, but for planning stage, once you are applying, I will say that no, the development work should be within the USA. Is there so, any other question, Sherry? Um, I don't see any other um, questions. I didn't see any other coming through. So perhaps we can open it up if folks just want to like un unmute and jump in with a question or if you 
are more comfortable raising your hand first, we can work with that too. I don't even know if we have the raise a hand thing here. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. there is a reaction okay. button on the bottom. There is a raise hand. Oh, I think so, Alexander spoke up. I, yeah, um, I had a question. I um, recently contacted a director at the USDA about a topic and um, they recommended that I switch to a different topic that was more relevant, which, you know, no problem there. But um, they recommended that I um, only contact by email. So with any questions, instead of having like an introductory meeting. So um, no problem there either, but I guess, am I missing out on any initial communication? And is there anything that I should consider asking the right. director before digging in? All right, thank you, Alexander. So a couple of things I'm gonna to mention to you <clears throat> that we really like to receive the phone call and other way of communication. But to be honest, we will be always busy with uh, different meetings and participation with other committees. So sometimes we just cannot receive the phone call and answer it right away. So I always recommend people that try to reach out us uh, through email because we have a policy that we have to reach back to our client within 48 hours. Okay, so we try to obligate that. If it is a Friday, we're gonna wait until Monday, but if it is Friday morning, you will see quick responses. So email, I will suggest it because we are kind of always busy with other committee members and involvements and a lot of meetings going on at NIFA, to be honest. So email would be the first one. Uh, in terms of, I, I talked with Heidi and Sherry regarding that. If you know that, any specific program area you are trying to apply within our 10 different categories, then the national program leaders contact information are in the RFA. I also make a list that I can also email you guys and share with it. Their phone numbers is there, but then their uh, email. So the first route would be definitely email them. Once you email them and see that do not get any response, please reach us, uh, reach to us, uh, SBIR mailbox. Uh, and we can try to kind of locate with the correct people. So that would be the one thing. But if you do not know which specific area is your innovation fall in and you want a general idea to start thinking and talking to someone, we do have a designated national program leader. His name is Dave Sonsted. And why not I just put uh, in the chat, that would be easier for you to follow up. Give, give me a second to do that. And he uh, he's knowledgeable for overall all the programs. So he will be your first contact uh, just to talk and decide. And then you know more about your specific area, then probably you can always uh, email to the specific program later. So in the chat, I put down Dave's um, email and phone number. So he would be your general contract for any of the query or questions. Then you can reach out to our specific national program leader. But one of the suggestions we always try to give our applicant uh, just to save some time. No. Oh. Sorry, I just gave it only to Sherry, but I want to share with all oh. of you, not only <laughs> her. Here you go. So we always try to say that, okay, write down two paragraphs or one page of your ideas or the proposals, what you are proposing and share with it before you meet with them. So they have a time to kind of a go through and know about your product or what you are thinking of and have better sense of kind of a communication once you meet with them. So always try to send, and they know that you are serious because you have an idea, you want their input. So share that saying that, hey, this is my idea. Can we meet sometimes just to discuss if it is a right fit or not? And Dave is pretty good on responding. Uh, he will do that. And once you know the specific program area leaders that I can just share the whole slide of um, from my computer, let's kind of see if I can do that. And then you can have all the NPLs listed there. Is it working out? Let's see. I think I made you co-host. You should be able to share. If, if not, okay. I will get that fixed. So I, I do have shared in the, in the chat. 
So you can see the word documents with all those 10 program and uh, national program data contacts information there. There you go. You can share the screen now, Narun. Sorry, I didn't have you listed as co-host. My apologies. That's fine. Uh, I'm sharing the file in the chat. So they have access. Thank there you. Yeah. Uh, so Alexander, I'll, I'll ask you kind of a do that. Uh, if you do not have any luck uh, emailing and then contacting with the NPL, uh, talk, uh, try to email with Dave. And if you do not have any luck with the specific NPL or Dave, please always email at SBIR at USDA at USDA.gov and uh, one of my colleagues and I take care of that mailbox. I'll try to reach out to you and connect to the right people. So I thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Naroon. Thank you, Heidi. You, you guys, Heidi, you did a great job staying on time. Love it. And you packed a lot of punch in there. Naroon, thank you so much for coming in with a lot of advice on the chat and in the Q&A and all that you've shared just in the last 15 minutes here. Um, I want to just share that when I spoke with Naroon yesterday, um, I got the idea that Heidi and Naroon and I should maybe consider organizing a like a USDA specific post award webinar sometime in like mid February, um, which is ideally suited for people who have been awarded, but also just might be really helpful for people who are thinking about applying for the one um, next year, just to kind of give you an idea of what all is involved in post award and things of that nature. So I yeah. uh, wanna just make sure, do we have any other questions coming through? I was wondering if there's uh, an easy to use uh, tool for searching research interest uh, for looking for involvement in maybe a CRADA agreement at uh, one of the national laboratories. From the USDA side, we do not have any specific one that we want to give it, but the first route is gonna be checking on the ARS, any source of ARS, federal lab, not should be USDA lab, only any ARS lab related to that would be fine. And I think that Heidi did have two um, websites. Those are pretty good. So those would be the first one. One quick thing I want to mention to you guys is that you always hear that 15% is the award rate for phase one. But one thing I want to remind you, last year we received around 700 application, but then admin review failed and then only passing mark was 525. So think about that 700 application, but we just wanted peer review 525. So that much was missing just because all the point Heidi was talking about, not having the page limit for the project narrative, the line spacing, the font size, those did not pass the admin review. So please take those seriously and look at the RFA, what the regulation and the guidelines it listed and follow those guidelines. Otherwise it does not go even to the peer review process. Thanks for that question. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Um, any other questions? I just wanted to put a plug in there, sorry, based on uh, the comments that we just heard as well, being careful that you are understanding all the technical requirements. And this can be a great reason to work with a consultant like Heidi, who is an expert, who knows all these little details and can work through it with you. So please use the free assistance available through the Illinois FAST Center, which is made possible by the U.S. Small Business Administration, which funds the FAST Center in Illinois and I think 30 states now presently. So we are lucky to have the resource and we have several great people who are here to help, including Heidi. I put the link in the chat if you want to sign up for individual assistance. That is a free resource to you as an Illinois company entrepreneur who wants to pursue SBIR funding. And we're very happy to have a strong concentration of ag tech in our state as a leading producer of corn, soybeans, livestock. Um, we are really keen on growing our continued ag innovation. So please pursue this program as a method to do that. And we have many other resources to support you as well. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And thank you so much to our speakers, Heidi Platt and Dr. Nahar. Thank you for inviting us. All of you, best luck. Thank Enjoy. You. Mm -hmm.